So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today we have a very special guest here at the law school and a very special program. So we have our own Dean Wendy Perdue and the new Dean of uh, Berkeley Law School, Erwin Chemerinsky. Um, and before handing the program over to them, I just want to take a second to a moment to mention just how amazing these two people are to be in the same room talking about the future of legal education. So uh, Wendy Perdue is known as, I mean, has been a recognized leader in legal education. She was vice president of uh, the Order of the Coif, which is the most prestigious honor uh, society for legal education. She has been in various leadership positions over the years for the American Association of Law Schools, and in 2017 became president-elect of uh, the American Association of Law Schools, AALS. Um, you know, and having, I have to say, having just received an email this week from a colleague at a top 50 school saying, my dean was wondering how Richmond is doing this. Um, I'll just tell you, this is um, somebody who's known for knowing legal education and how to build a law school. And then we have uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, and I have to say, the first time I met Erwin Chemerinsky, he, he is, this is such an impressive man, I was intimidated and scared. And the second time too, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Erwin Chemerinsky. And um, what I came to find out is, this is one of the nicest human beings you will ever meet. He is such an amazing man and so talented. Um, he is known as one of the top constitutional law scholars in the United States. Um, he has argued cases before the Supreme Court. He has written hundreds of law review articles. He has written 10 books. He started a law school. Now he's dean at Berkeley. And he's also on the executive board of AALS. He is and has been on National Law Journal's list of the top 25 most influential people in legal education. So these two are going to talk about the future of legal education. And um, boy, it's, it's amazing to have them here to talk about it. So with that, I'll just say let's welcome them and uh, get started. So, Erwin, thank, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you for the incredibly sweet introduction. Um, uh, Professor Chemerinsky um, had to be at a faculty meeting in California yesterday. So it basically took the red eye to get here. It means if he nods off, I'll just give him a little, I won't. I I'll give him a little just give him a little, push, give him a little push. Um, so future of legal education. Let's start broad. You started a law school. You're at another law school. What's your overall sense? How, do you, how are you feeling about um, legal education and its future? We'll get into details uh, in a minute. Is, I think we're going to enter a vibrant, really terrific phase for legal education. Um, some of it is I think we're going to see a great increase in law school applications. I think the effect of the Trump presidency is going to cause more people to want to go to law school to make a difference through law. I don't know, obviously, your statistics here. I don't know national statistics. But at this moment, Berkeley Law School's applications are up 35% over last year at this time. I have taught undergraduate students for the last 25 years. And I've heard from so many more of my undergraduates who had pursued other things that now they want to go to law school. I think of what occurred on Saturday, January 28th, the day after the initial travel ban was announced, where lawyers all over the country went with their laptops to help those who had the right to be in the United States and being kept out. And I think this image is going to cause people to go to law school, just like it was the civil rights lawyers in the 1950s and 60s that caused me to decide to go to law school. I know there's been a decrease in law school applications since 2010, when law school applications were at their all-time high. But having been a law professor now for 38 years, 
I've seen law school applications go up and down before. I remember in the late 1980s, law school applications went way down. And then the TV show LA Law, I don't know if you remember LA Law, um, caused lots of people to apply for law school. Um, I think that's going to be the effect of the Trump presidency. There's going to be a generation of people who go to law school for the best possible reason. They think that law is the most powerful tool for social change. And I think it then lets us as law schools think about what our role is in terms of helping make society better. So, as you know, the, um, actually, the, although there was a lot of focus on the decline in applications in the last six or seven years, it's actually part of a much longer trend um, if you look at the percentage of, of undergraduates, not, not in absolute numbers. Uh, any sense of why uh, a starting, I mean, it, it increased through the 50s and 60s, peaked in early 70s, and then actually as a percentage has been declining since then. And this is as a measure of undergraduates who expressed an interest, interest. in law as a career. And I don't have any good explanation of that. I do think that there was a whole generation of people, and I am part of it, who went to law school because they were inspired by the civil rights lawyers, because they wanted to be part of that kind of social change. On the other hand, the civil rights movement of the 1960s is as long ago for current undergraduates as World War I was for me. That's ancient history. And I think that's why what's going on now may inspire quite different sense among undergraduates and prospective law school applicants. So um, what's your sense of, of kind of overall quality of legal education? In the decline, there, there was a lot that came out about how law schools um, were, didn't prepare students to practice, didn't do what they needed to do. What's your, what's your read on that? To be honest with you, I think one of the things that as legal educators, very hard to talk about, is that law schools are not homogeneous. There's an enormous difference among the range of law schools. And that's hard to say. And so let me take the top 75 law schools as compared to the unranked law schools. And I'm using U.S. News as a rough indication. I'm not a fan of U.S. News. I can talk as long as you want about what's wrong with it. But it at least gives us a sense that we can commonly use for dividing schools. I think legal education among those top 75 law schools is as good as it's ever been. I think legal education is thankfully now much more oriented to preparing students for the practice of law. I think the most important development since I was in law school in the mid-1970s is the growth of legal clinics, the recognition that if we're going to prepare students to be lawyers, we need to give them experiential education. I think if you look at some of the unranked law schools, it's a different story. They've been suffering in terms of finances. There have been layoffs of faculty at some of those schools. I have friends, I'm sure you do, who were laid off or forced into retirement they didn't want. Law schools at that level replacing full-time faculty with part-time faculty. And so I can't generalize and say overall legal education is the best it's been. I think at the schools like Richmond, the schools where I've been, I think legal education is much better than it used to be. Uh, you know, some have argued, um, Brian Tamanaha in particular, that sort of building on that, that differentiation, that we ought to encourage and facilitate it, that we ought to have some three-year law schools for, that exist, um, but allow one or two-year law schools with, all taught by adjuncts, no library, cheap, um, quick, uh, and, and, and encourage that differentiation. But thoughts on that one? Sure, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of these questions. I think the question is, should we leave the quality of law schools entirely to the market, or should we have some minimal accreditation standards? Because one way of doing it is to say, let's not have any accreditation standards, let's let law schools do whatever they want to do, have students take the bar, and if they can pass the bar, they can become lawyers, 
And there want to be one-year law schools, two-year law schools, three-year law schools. They'll get to choose that. Students will decide where to go, and the market will decide who to hire them, and the market will decide where the law schools exist. I don't favor that approach. I believe that we should have minimal standards for legal education, and that any law school should have to meet that minimum. Any number of years of law school is arbitrary. I think three years works well. Would you be better trained if you graduated from a four or five year law school? Of course you would, but then there'd be that much in the way of costs. I don't think if we cut the number of years of law school, we could prepare you as well for the practice of law. I don't think that with two thirds or one third of the amount of time, you'd be as good enter the legal profession as you are after three years of law school. I also fear if we went to two year or one year legal education, where most be cut are the clinical programs, which I regard as so important in preparing students for the practice of law. So we can always argue over a particular ABA accreditation standard and we think it's good or bad, and there are many that are there I don't think relate to the quality of legal education. But overall, I, I think the current system has worked well for a long time, and I'd be loath to change it. It, it, it is uh, interesting, I, in, in the conversations over should law school be shorter, I don't have, a, when I talk to employers, there are not a lot of employers who say to me, the trouble with your graduates is they know about a third too much. Um, so uh, it, 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 it doesn't seem from an employer point of view that that's been uh, since now. It's, obviously, it's, it's expensive. And, and in fact, what, um, what we're seeing in the profession is employers devoting less time and resources to training. Yes. Um, and so the question is, if that's happening, where is the... Who's going to train Who's going to train? I think that's such an important point. The reality is the legal profession wants law school graduates to be more practice ready than they've ever been before. I've heard, as I'm sure you do from many law firms, that they can't build the time of first year associates. Clients won't pay for that. Well, if we're going to have a situation where they're going to hire first year associates, we have to give them first year associates where they can build the time, where they, first year associates can contribute. We couldn't do that in two thirds or one third of the time. So one of the interesting questions, I mean, talking about being ready to practice, what practice means is, is a, um, highly diverse. Um, and there's you know, some talk of, uh, about the, because of artificial intelligence, the ch change in, in technology, that many of the tasks that lawyers used to do are now being automated. What do you see the practice of law looking like? Is it going to change dramatically? A significant part of the practice of law is criminal cases. I think criminal cases are still going to have prosecutors and defense counsel. Now, there's ways in which the practice of criminal law has changed, and we can talk about that. Now, plea bargaining is such a huge part of what goes on in the criminal justice system. But I don't see artificial intelligence or computers replacing prosecutors or defense counsel in criminal cases. Or maybe judges, or judges right. either. No, I don't think so. Uh, it's, um, th that's, of course, because judging involves judgment, and that's an inherently human task. Well, I start with that as an example, but I can generalize. Um, when you think about what lawyers do, advising clients, what client wants to be advised by a computer? Right? We want a human being who can listen to us and advise us. Negotiating. Hard to imagine two artificial intelligence programs negotiating a deal. Um, arguing in court. I think we're a long way from somebody turning on their computer and having a voice synthesizer presenting the argument in court. Now, that doesn't deny there's things that computers do. I think the whole notion of document searches that young associates at big firms used to do is now being done either in an automated way or being outsourced to other countries. But I think that is much more about at the margins what's going on than at the core of legal practice. So, I mean, what, what I hear you saying is that those core um, sort of human skills uh, that involve um, 
empathy, interaction, negotiating right. um, remains central and um, core to what we ought to be doing in law schools. Yeah. When, uh, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do is go talk to a lot of junior high school and high school students. I think while I was in Irvine, I spoke at every single junior high school to the eighth grade students. And one of the things I try to get them to see about law, and certainly want law students to see it as well, is that as a lawyer, you can really make a difference in people's lives. People go to see lawyers often when they're the most difficult moments that we can go through. A death, um, a divorce, somebody in the family being arrested. In all of those instances, you want to go to a human being who has just the traits that you described. The empathy, the knowledge, the competence. I don't see that ever changing. So uh, looking out, um, the, 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 those are the, the benefits of law school, the reasons that we need strong legal education. What are the most, what are the, the worries that keep you up at night that relate to legal education? Sure. There might be some others that um, we can talk about later. <laughs> my greatest worry as a dean is about money. And my greatest worry about legal education is about money. And they're interrelated, obviously. Um, I really worry about the cost of legal education, as I'm sure everyone who's sitting in this room does. I worry about how many students have to finish their education with crushing debt. I worry about how that constrains the career choices of those who are entering legal practice. And so, if you ask me what's the greatest fear or worry I have, it all comes down to how do, how do we pay for all this? So how do we pay for it? I wish I knew. You know, I, I've spent, I'm now at a state university, I spent the last nine years before coming here as a state university. In my state, no longer does the state subsidize legal education. Um, my wife went to the University of California, Berkeley Law School, and she talks about how when she was there in the mid-1980s, it was $750 a semester to go to law school. Now at Berkeley, if you're an in-stater, it's $45,000, and if you're not a state, it's $55,000, which is essentially the same as the private schools in the state. And we haven't had a tuition increase since 2012. And that's because the state of California no longer subsidizes. Um, as I was saying to you earlier, of my budget, 5% of the money comes from the state or the campus. 95% of the money has to come from other sources. 62% of all our revenue comes from tuition. 18% comes from our advanced degree programs like LLMs. Um, some comes from endowment, but only 5% comes from the state. And I've been told by my chancellor and vice chancellor, they want us soon to make up so we're 100% financially independent. California is not unique. And it's hard to object to that in a state that spends far too little on K through 12 education and say, but you should spend more money on legal education. But that then means we face our students are going to have to take out huge amounts of loans in order to pay for legal education. Private schools are in the same situation. And of course, it's not just with regard to law schools. I mean, law school tuition resembles what, as you all know so well, college tuition is, especially at private universities. Um, so students, I regularly hear graduating over $200,000 in debt. And I think the question that we face as legal educators is, what can we do to help those students with regard to debt? Loan repayment assistance programs, for example. And, and as I uh, talk with people about what, what are the options, there are not a lot of uh, of of options, we can say to prospective students, um, fund it with accumulated wealth. That's an option, but, For those uh, who have. but that's a very, very small category. Um, we can say, fund it the way one funds other large investments, which is that you treat it as a capital investment and you borrow. Or you can find somebody else to pay for it, um, uh, either a state or a generous donor, but they're not really ultimately any other um, options. Uh, although, so, you know, some, as we talked about earlier, some um, schools have, have explored the possibilities of other um, payment systems, and some countries have, a, well, some countries actually think that 
um, higher education and even professional education is a, is a social obligation that the society is better off. And so they view it not as a private good, but as a, as a public good. And so invest. In our country more. used to for public universities, the University of California system was all about the idea that everyone should be able to get a low cost college, even professional education. And they had this great master plan of the community colleges and the state schools and the University of California. And it was all subsidized by the state. The state now has dramatically cut its subsidy. And when it comes to a public university, which I say I'm part of, there's only three choices. Either the state subsidizes, or you raise tuition, or you cut quality. There is no door number four. And that's what's so frightening. And of course, I know University of Virginia was one of the first public university law schools to just go to a privatized model, to just say, we're going to charge private school tuition and we're going to therefore be able to have the quality that we want to be. But it's a, an enormous problem. And of course, private universities now do have to charge tuition that leads to this crushing debt. Uh, there's always uh, talk of, of maybe there are um economies that we haven't uh, um, uh, noticed, in either in using uh, distance learning or some other uh, um, mechanisms that would dramatically cut costs. I am, prior to being a dean, I would have said that. After being a dean and having to deal for 10 years with the budget as a dean, I don't think you can do that without dramatically cutting quality. Um, I don't obviously know your budget. In Irvine, which is the budget I have best, 78% of my budget was faculty and staff salary and benefits. Well, how then can you cut cost? You could replace full-time faculty with part-time faculty. That would be the one way to create a very low-cost law school. But I think it would be an inferior law school. That's not to say that part-time faculty don't enrich every law school, they, especially in areas of specialty, are enormously important. But I know the evaluations at Irvine were overall the full-time faculty had better student evaluations than the part-time faculty. That makes sense because they have more time to prepare and they can focus on pedagogy as a key part of their professional life. Also, full-time faculty are around much more than part-time faculty generally can be. And a lot of education goes on in the halls and in the offices and in informal interactions. And if you cut staff, then you're cutting services to students. Well, then how do you create the lower cost law school without cutting quality? I think distance learning can be a nice supplement to what's offered in a law school. If there's not a course that's offered, because we're a, is it a small course, I'd say, okay, well, if there's a distance. But I, I've taught distance learning. Distance learning cannot substitute for the magic what goes on in a classroom. Um, our current governor, Jerry Brown, doesn't want to build any more buildings in any of the University of California saying, we should do distance learning instead. And my response is, how many parents would rather have their kids stay home in the basement and go to college by distance learning as opposed to experience a college or a university? We can't substitute distance learning for higher education, though it can supplement it. So a couple other topics that I know um have been very much uh, discussed, and then we'll open it up for other people's questions. Um, bar exam, California's had some, they've been in the news a bit on, on the bar exam. Uh, first of all, I guess they'll start with the, kind of the broader question. Is, is the current bar exam as kind of currently structured, what's your sense of it as a way to um, assure quality of the profession? I think the current bar exam does a terrible job of measuring the skills that go into being a good lawyer. Think of all the skills you use as a lawyer, and are they really reflected in how you do on 200 multi-state questions or a day of essay questions? It's so much more a rite of passage than anything that's ever been shown to be linked to measuring quality as a lawyer. It's there. I think one of the really great developments in the last five years that will benefit many of you is the uniform bar exam. That now I think it's 26 states participate in the uniform bar exam. Not, not yet Virginia. Um, not yet California. We're, we're yeah. working on that. <laughs> um, yeah, California's a long way from it. But 
it will matter so much in terms of career mobility because you take one bar exam and then go to any of the UBE states and be able to be admitted to practice. And I think that's a, a good, it doesn't go to your question of, is there any relationship between what's being tested and being able to be a lawyer? It just would help in that regard. California is a very complicated story. Um, some of it is anti-competitive. California gives no reciprocity to other states. That's because it doesn't want retired lawyers from other states or lawyers want to move there to come and practice there. Same reason Florida doesn't give reciprocity. And that shouldn't be a reason for any rules, um, but I think that's a lot of it. California is unique in that in addition to having ABA accredited schools, it has California state accredited schools and unaccredited schools. And if I mention to you some of the unaccredited schools, I'm reasonably sure you've never heard of them. The Simon Greenleaf School of Law. It operates in a small shopping mall taught with everything by Simon Greenleaf. But you can open your own law school in California in a storefront like that. Um, and then, so as a result, you can't look at the overall bar pass rate of California because the unaccredited and state accredited schools have about a 10% bar pass rate. California has historically been about a two-thirds bar pass rate for ABA accredited schools, which is lower than some states, but not terribly so. But California has the second most strict, what's called cut score, passing score of any in the state. And so almost all of the deans of California have gotten together to try to pressure the California Supreme Court to lower the cut score to increase the bar pass rate. In the privacy of this room, there is a tremendous irony to, to the dynamics of that that no one again can talk about. This is being driven in part because some of the law schools in the state have had very low bar pass rate in recent years. There's one law school that's an ABA credit school that had a 22% bar pass rate last year. There's another 35%, another 38%. And so there's a sense that trying to change the cut scores is to try to help those schools out. And yet, changing the cut score by a few points would actually help the more elite schools more because their students who fail the bar are usually missing by just a few points. And so there's this dynamic that just no one feels comfortable talking about. And I've had a member of the California Supreme Court say that the justices perceive this to some extent as just self-dealing by the law schools. The law schools just want to help themselves. And so I'm not sure what the California Supreme Court is going to do. The request to change the cut score is pending now. None of which goes to the question that really matters. How could we measure the ability to practice law in a meaningful sense? And I don't think that's what we're focusing. I think we're focusing on what's the three points in the cut score. Um, I, my understanding is that in Canada they use an open book exam for the, um, the, the, of course the National Conference of Bar Examiners um, assert that the bar exam is not a memory test. Of course it is. <laughs> I never in my property class had to learn the rule against perpetuities. Uh, and those of you who teach property, I'm not defending that, but my property is, I went to the bar exam and I didn't memorize the rule against perpetuities. I promptly forgot it after the bar exam. Other than I watched the movie Body Heat, where it was very important right. in that yeah. movie. Yes. Um, the bar exam is a tremendous amount of memorization. It's why bar review lectures spend time you know, giving people mnemonic devices and things like that. Um, I don't know of instances a lawyer where you wouldn't be able to look something up. Um, Indeed, I actually um, worry that in some sense it um, might uh, teach exactly the wrong habit. Um, when the civil procedure was added as, a, yeah. as a, 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 a subject, I took a look at the sample questions and found myself thinking, I, I actually want to look that up. Um, notwithstanding having taught civil procedure for, for 25 years. Um, so, you know, remembering uh, whether Rule 38 says you have 15 days or 30 days to, to uh, file for um, a jury trial or 10 days, um, 
it seems to me when we tell students memorize this, we've, we've actually said uh, don't develop the habit of checking. I completely agree with you. And, and two thoughts in response. One is I have dramatically changed the kind of exams that I give over the time that I've been a law professor. I used to give the traditional three, three and a half hour, four hour in class exam. Um, I now only give eight hour take homes where it's open book, open notes exams, where you can download it anytime during the exam period and you have eight hours after you download it to turn it in and you can look at anything you want. And I've discovered that those exams much better reflect the kind of skills that I want to measure. That I worry that in class traditional exams or the bar exam disproportionately measure writing fast or typing fast and thinking fast in a way that doesn't have any resemblance to what we do as lawyers. The other thing that comes to mind you say that is, I think one of the most destructive things the bar exam has done for the teaching of professional responsibility and ethics is the creation of the multi-state professional responsibility exam. Where this enormous, and I've taught professional responsibility at a number of different schools, there's enormous pressure on the teacher to just tell the students what they need to memorize for this three hour test. In fact, I haven't done it for a while, I've taught the class for a while, I finally got to the point where I began the first week of class giving a bar review lecture saying this is everything you need to know for the MPRE. We're going to spend the first week and I'll give you the MPRE review lecture. Here it is, the same one I do for a bar review company. And now we can spend the rest of the semester talking about all the important things you need to know and think about for practice. But the MPRE has exactly the effect that you've described and I think it's been quite destructive with regard to teaching professional responsibility in law schools. Well, I suppose we, at some point we could have a conversation on how we're going to how we're going to change the world with respect to the bar exam. But yeah. we might. I'm just glad you're the president of the company to be of the double ALS. And I'm glad you're on the executive committee. committee. Uh, well, why don't we open it up? See if, uh, if if there are questions, comments, reflections. If you have a question, come on up to the mic. You're in the midst of legal education. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we as legal educators can do better. So my question is, if you either make law school two years and have like the third year as like a long clinical placement in some subject you would go to, because you believe clinical placements is where we learn, or have it three years of education and the fourth year be a clinical placement, how would you feel about the change in law school then? I had the wonderful advantage of being the founding dean of a new law school, which meant we had a blank slate. And one of the things that we did at the very beginning was decide to require that all students participate in a legal clinic in order to graduate. And the original thought was that the clinic was going to be in the third year of law school, so as to answer that. We actually, after starting that way, moved the clinical requirement to either being the spring of the second year or fall of the third year, we discovered many problems with having it be second semester, third year. And also, the advantage of letting students start earlier is a lot of students wanted to stay clinic more than one semester, and they want to do an advanced clinic, so letting them start spring of their second year would be able to accomplish that. Um, clinical education is expensive. And so we had to make the choice at the beginning to devote enough faculty slots that we would be able to give an in-house clinical experience to all the students. It's much more difficult to do in an existing law school. Um, again, in the privacy of this room, I'll tell a story that illustrates that. Before I went to UC Irvine, I was a professor at Duke Law School. And I had the opportunity one year to chair the curriculum committee. And I had just the right composition of the curriculum committee that I could get the curriculum committee to approve having all students have to have a clinical experience while in law school. It then went to the faculty, and I didn't have five votes. And the faculty didn't want to see future faculty slots filled with clinicians. They wanted to hire more people like them, and they didn't want to see such a large part of the budget directed in that way. I think it was a tremendous advantage of having a blank slate to be able to do that. Um, I think that some of the financial pressures of law schools has made it harder to provide expansion of clinical education, or at least for some law schools that's and so. But I agree with the premise of your question, and the way I've often put it is, could you imagine if medical schools 
trained doctors or the medical students had never seen patients. Would any of us want to be treated by those doctors? And of course in medical school, not only do we begin seeing patients, sometimes from early on, but then they have to do residencies. And in law, we don't have the equivalent. One of the things that we created at UCI, and I'll tell you how, and I'll be interested in what Wendy has to say, the chancellor who hired me at UCI was an ophthalmologist by training. And he talked about he began seeing patients from the beginning of medical school. And he said, isn't there some way of having law students engage with clients in their first year? And we came up with the idea of having all of our second semester first year students placed in either a legal aid or a public defender office and have to go do intake interviews. First, they'd get some classroom instruction on interviewing. Then they have to watch an experienced lawyer do interviewing. And then they would have to do interviewing. Many of them, certainly not all of the students, described what a terrific experience was to interact with clients in the beginning of law school. Um, so I'd like to see clinical education not just be part of the third year, but some way to integrate it through legal education. And one observation on that, um, at many schools, including our school, um, a lot of that happens, although it happens through our pro bono activities. Mm -hmm. So a number of our students, beginning in the first year, would be interacting with clients in some capacity, um, though, not as, though not as a requirement. And so yeah, I think you see that as a, um, in, in many um, schools and certainly, certainly here. One other just a point, um, although we don't require clinics, I'll give you a little statistic. Um, last year, 35% of our graduating class tried a case before they graduated. Isn't that amazing? That's a wonderful statistic. I doubt any or many law schools could match that. Um, uh, but it's done not, so it, schools make choices on, on what's, what's right. required and what's not required. But that then means if those students are going to go be prosecutors or public defenders or do civil litigation, they know where to sit in the courtroom. They know where to stand. <laughs> That's a big deal. Uh, why don't you go, go to the mic? It, There's a couple of Come on up. Go, go. Uh, yes, sir. I'm curious why you think the legal education hasn't embraced the idea of some business schools, the executive programs. You know, I think that you, there is, you can take kind of, uh, you know, law school classes at night, but probably from the shopping mall ones that you mentioned before. Uh, I mean, there's an immense pressure to do a full-time program, and I'm curious why you think the legal education hasn't embraced the executive programs. It depends on what you mean by executive program. If what you mean is the ability to go to law school at night, take the same number of courses, and get the same degree, there are countless law schools in the country with night programs. Um, I think both Georgetown and GW in Washington have yes. programs. Yes, so, so uh, Georgetown had one of the largest, most vibrant of those. Uh, um, in Los Angeles, which I know best, Loyola Southwestern, have night programs. Um, so there are many law schools that have night programs. There's a long story to be told about why the elite schools, other than Georgetown really, eliminated their night programs. And it's not a very flattering story of the legal profession. And there's a great book by Gerald Auerbach called Unequal Justice that tells that story. So generally, the night programs aren't at the most prestigious law schools, again, Georgetown being an exception, but there is the ability to do that. One of the interesting things is that the decrease in law school applications has disproportionately affected the night programs. And I'm not sure why that is. Um, but Loyola in Los Angeles used to have a night program of 100 students. It's down to about 30 students. And it's not their choice. They're just not getting the applications. Um, U.S. News has also contributed to that in a very subtle way. It used to be that measuring LSAT and GPA, the night programs were not counted for the school. And so they could look at other factors like life experience, work experience. U.S. News began counting the LSAT and GPA in the school's overall ranking. And I think that's contributed to something. And it's not, again, a very flattering story. There's another thing that you might mean by executive education, and it's a non-degree certificate type program. 
business schools do a lot of these. And I think law schools are doing a lot too. Um, in fact, one of the things already in my first three months at Berkeley is we're tremendously increasing our executive education programs, but they're non-degree programs. Or they're um, uh, subsequent to LLM programs right. for um, people who have a first degree in law. Right. There, there are um, right. additional education. Right. Then there are also the, the new one-year non-lawyer law degrees. This is a trend. Uh, masters that, of legal uh, studies. Masters of legal studies. So um, if you want to get a master's degree in something and you haven't decided, should I go get a master's degree in political science or should I get a master's degree in history or English, a number of schools would, would offer a master's degree in law. It does not entitle you to take the bar exam. Um, it doesn't entitle you to practice law. But if, if you um, are in some other allied profession and find it helpful to know, know about law, those are, those are very much a part of the landscape today. Thank you. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why law students are so much more stressed out than our counterparts in med school and graduate programs and what educators and administrators can do to maybe alleviate some of that. It's a great question. Um, I, is, I think you asked two questions. A why <laughs> question and a what can we do about it question. I don't know as to the why question. I've certainly seen studies about d degrees of stress in law school and maybe Wendy knows, maybe you in the audience have a better sense of why the large level of stress. Um, in terms of what to do about it, um, that I spent a lot more time thinking about. Um, Berkeley Law School has a half-time position of a profession, a psychologist professional counselor who's in residence half the week just to work with law students. Um, just recently, um, like last week, the head of the student affinity groups came to me and said they wanted to have a half-time counselor who was trained in working with underrepresented minority students. And I, I put in money to hire someone to come from the campus with that specialty. Um, they want to, the students have just applied literally last Friday for money from the Wellness Fund to create more wellness-oriented programs for students, mindfulness courses, yoga classes in the law school. Um, so I think there are things that we can do as well as simple things that we can do, you know. Um, I'm big on feeding people, as obviously your school is too. Um, <laughs> having food available for students before exams, um, having opportunities for people to get together in a relaxed way. So I don't have any magic solution, but something that I think we as legal educators need to spend more time focusing. I don't know if you have answers and, to that. Well, you know, th there was a report, um, a, a national report, report that came out uh, just a couple weeks ago on well-being within the profession. Um, and suggest that there's a um, there's a issue for for our profession of um, substance abuse, yes. depression, um, and the causes of that are not not clear as to why within the legal profession is it worse than other professions. Well, high stress job, yeah. Um, my, my brother's a pediatric neurosurgeon. That's a high-stress job. Yeah. Um, so uh, w is there something about the nature of law? Is there something about the nature of what we do? Um, I, I mean, I've wondered whether because lawyers act as agents for others and, and in some contexts have to suppress their own s sense of what's the right thing to do, does that cause some disjointedness, um, lack of wholeness in one's being. The, the doctor knows it's, it's headed, you, you're headed to health and well-being, there's no kind of question about that. Um, uh, where lawyers may be in the role of representing others' interests, not their own. Does that oh, add to, really the, to the tension? I don't know. Though I do think the good development, I mean, it's a, a fascinating thought. I do think the good development answer to your question is, I think law schools are paying much more attention to this than they used to. That, um, again, I can speak about my law school, 
for the first time, I think, they did a program required for all first year students on substance abuse. Because there is, as you're saying, a, a problem in the profession of that. Um, I don't think there used to be courses on mindfulness in law schools. Um, so that it's just the beginning, but I think we really need to address the mental and emotional health of our students. And we need it for the profession. Would right. be, it, we need it for our students while they are here, and we right. need to make sure we are producing um, healthy lawyers um, for society. Thank you both so much for having this conversation. Um, my question is geared towards what comes after law school. So to some extent, the quality of legal education does not necessarily correlate to your prospects after your education. And I'm wondering how both of you as deans take that into account when you structure the law school, what sorts of things you're looking to improve when it comes to employment statistics, um, or even just making sure that your students are able to be more mobile in not just a regional school or a school that has name recognition. Thank you. We, of course, can't control the employment market out there. Um, there's only so much that we can do in that regard. Uh, there have been significant changes I, over the years that, that were worth highlighting. Um, I, at an alumni event not too long ago, I met an alum who said, as a second year student, he was the career office. Um, that, that, was, that was the world of, of actually when I was a law student. Um, so we've, we've professionalized, we've added the resources. Um, we, so here, um, we, we try to create as many, as much, provide as much information as is, uh, as possible about what the options are. Um, regional versus uh, more national. We were, we were talking about that schools have different characters um, and reputations and it's, uh, there's only so much a school can do in helping um, employers far away know about us. But we do, we do a lot of um, outreach, and, I, and I'm sure your, your schools have done. I mean, you must have had faced this as, with UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. no, no one knew what you were. Um, and so you do outreach um, to encourage uh, employers to understand what you um, offer. You encourage your students to look uh, broadly. Um, one of the interesting problems we have here is although half our students come from out, out of state, the majority get here and want to stay. Um, turns out it's a nice place to be. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, I'd like more of our students to decide they were going back to Florida and Texas um, because actually that's an important part of our public relations. You are, students are our very best ambassadors. Um, I want all our graduates to have their diplomas on the wall and be our ambassadors going out. Um, so there's a kind of back and forth of, of um, where do people want to be and, and where are the opportunities. I very much agree with all of that. Um, I think we have an ethical duty to help all of our students to the best we can have the kind of careers that they want to begin with. And so we put tremendous responsibility in our career service offices to find the opportunities for students, to facilitate the students getting those opportunities. Um, one of the things that I think, and this may be going a little bit afield, that developed for perhaps not such good reasons, but now is very important, is many law schools write fellowships to students after graduation to send a year working in a public interest organization. It's a key way of launching a public interest career. One of the best of these programs is called Gideon's Promise, where if the law school pays for the student for one year after graduation to work in a public defender's office, the student is guaranteed a job in that office for the next two years. US News has chosen not to count those or to tremendously discount those as jobs, even though they have to pay $40,000 a year in order to be counted. And now schools are drawing up those programs, and I'm very worried about that. So here we do um, a version of that. We do a four-month program. We made the choice to, to extend it to more students for a shorter mm -hmm. amount of time rather than a few students for um, a longer period. 
Um, and, but it functions the same way that students get the opportunity to connect, uh, particularly while they're waiting for It's a wonderful uh, bridge. As a bridge, bridge to practice, yes. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, targeting the bar exam and not really like the theoretical framework of um, the legal world, is that more external or internal? Meaning like a lot of schools, for example, have um, first year law classes where you do not have to take uh, civil procedure or torts or certain, like you can choose your kind of um, courses. Not that I love civil procedure, I love torts, I love all those <laughs> As, as <laughs> well you should. Um, uh, I'm just wondering what, what that difference makes um, in letting the law student first year plunge into his own or her own uh, schedule um, in comparison to a structured one that everyone has to take. On the one hand, I think everyone should graduate law school knowing the basics of torts, because it comes up then as a foundation for so many other years of law. I think if you're not going to be a civil litigator, knowing something about civil procedure is really important because it's the backdrop then of business transactions, knowing what can go to court. And so hard to imagine that any law school would want to graduate law students where they didn't have certain basic subjects like that. On the other hand, having been a law professor for a long time, I've been part of fights over first year curriculum at a number of different schools, I ultimately shrug and say, it doesn't matter to me what's taught in the first year and what's an upper level elective. Um, should con law be in the first year or should it be an upper level? I'm a con law teacher, I don't care. Should property be in the first year or should it be, as was it Irvine, an upper level elective? It doesn't matter. Um, I think when I've been part of these curricular discussions, it's ama amazing how much law professors can make their preferences sound like matters of principle. I come away with it and say, doesn't matter what's in the first year and what's in the second year. Ultimately, the first year, no matter what the course is, we have to teach the same basic analytical skills. And I get frustrated when curriculum reform is, you know, is contracts five units or four units? Is it a one semester, two semester? What difference does it make? So one observation I'd make is that actually there's not, there are not very many places um, where the first year, where there's much choice in the first year. There are, um, uh, Yale is an exception. The first semester um, is required. I believe everything after that is not. Um, beyond that, most places, most of the first year is a fixed curriculum. Some have an elective that's in there, but it's not the, it's not the pattern. And I think for good reason, in that uh, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is that the reality is many students come in thinking they know what they want. They come in knowing, by golly, I know I don't want, I'm not interested in torts. Um, how would you know that? Um, or I know I'm going to do um, uh, some, some area of law. And so I think it actually puts um, uh, un undue burdens on students, particularly in the first year, to say, I, I expect you to know what you're interested in. Um, likewise, I would say, to, you know, we've had some analogies to medical school, would you say to uh, the doctor, you know, decide what you want to, what, what parts of the body are you interested in? Um, I think we wouldn't do that. I think we'd say, no, there's, a, there's an important core that we really expect of, of all students. You will specialize. You're going to decide whether you're going to be a, 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 a dermatologist or whatever, outside or inside of the body. But I think that that it actually uh, would do a disservice to most students to have a lot of choice in the first year. Thank you. I agree. And I think we're uh, we'll take we're, we're winding up. We're going to have the last question. Okay. Thank you so much. Um... We'll stick around. I just want to, yeah, just for the, the, um, student, the number of students who have, have classes. We'll stick around and take out the question. Um, briefly, what, what are your thoughts on the merits of getting rid of grades? I know some programs at some of the elite universities have dispensed with grades. Is that good? Is that dumb? What are your thoughts? Talk. I think we would do a tremendous disservice to our students if we got rid of grades. Employers want the law schools to do some kind of a sorting. If we didn't, those employers would go someplace else. 
And so I wish it were that we didn't need to have grades. Maybe we could decrease the stress of it that way. Um, and I'm now at a school that has the high honors, honors pass, rather than the school I just came from, that the A plus, A, A minus. And I actually believe that's to the detriment of our students. And I don't know what your grading system is here. But if you think about it, when I'm grading, the difference between the lowest A minus and the highest B plus is an arbitrary line. The lowest A minus, it inevitably is. You have to draw a line. You have to draw a line. In an A minus B plus system, it's the difference between a 3 7 and a 3 3. But in a system that has high honors, honors pass, that still calculates things like order of coif, it's the difference between a 4.0 and a 3.0. Having fewer gradations magnifies the difference in a way that I think is to the disadvantage of the students. So I wish there weren't grades. I wish it could be pass fail. Um, but I, I think it would really hurt our students. And that's true, I think, uh, all except maybe a, the top couple of law schools. I think we'll stop there. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.